go to the games, Pyeongchang, what handful of memories are your favorite? Were there any moments that put that smile on your face? Uh, a once in a lifetime moment where you're in the same place as thousands of other people who, if given the choice, would not want to be anywhere else. And I think that's really accurate that every single athlete in that arena is just, they're exactly where they want to be. And the excitement of that collective, like just there's so much energy. And so for me, like walking out into the arena with Team USA to, you know, do our nation walk, I can't even describe the joy and the excitement and the collective energy of the environment. You wrap up Pyeongchang, have a great experience, and once you're an Olympian, you're always an Olympian. What's next? When people talk about that post-Olympic depression, I felt that. I went to my first term of college, spring of 2018 at Dartmouth. When I showed up, it felt like everyone there, all the other students knew what they wanted to do with their lives and they were super put together. They knew how to write papers. Like I hadn't done schoolwork in two and a half years. And so I just felt like I was drowning in this whole other world. And like that was more real life than what I had been experiencing for the last two years. After being introduced to so many people as that, it really made me worry about who the hell I was because I, I didn't have anything outside of sport or I didn't know that I had things outside of sport. I'm a perfectionist and I have this very innate fear of complacency and having reached the highest sport, then I, what, what was complacency then? Like if I stayed where I was at, at the World Cup level, was that like, there's nowhere to go from there. So I turned inward and I became extremely self-critical. I started having a lot of really major body image issues and and really struggled with how I could make myself better, how I could become a more perfect version of myself, a better athlete, a better student, better person to interact with. That really blew up in my face in the spring of 2020 when COVID hit, school went remote, which I started hating myself. When you say I didn't know who I was, what does that mean? I knew myself as Alice Merriweather, the skier. I didn't want to just be Alice Merriweather, the skier. I wanted to be other things, I, or I wanted to feel like I could recognize other aspects of my person. I couldn't think of anything meaningful other than myself as an athlete. And so in becoming an Olympian, I had reached the highest level. But in terms of labels, I I didn't have anywhere to go and that really scared me. And then I was going to school and meeting a ton of new people and I just didn't have that many really close relationships in my life at that point. And so my identity as an Olympian was kind of all that was getting projected out to these people. And so I think that my my lack of really close relationships during that time, as I was kind of transitioning between a lower level of the national team and the full World Cup team, going to school, making a lot of new connections there, but not being super close to anyone and spending a lot more time away from my family, it just left me kind of feeling isolated. At what point did you know that you had a problem? I knew that I had body image problems a year before the eating disorder even started. I began working with a sports psychologist to address that because I really struggled one spring camp. I had to stop training because I felt so uncomfortable the way that I perceived my body and to have to be in a skin tight suit. Like it just, I skied out halfway down my second run and I just cried for like almost three hours straight. The rest of the training session, I went over to one of my coaches and I just cried. and. That was a sign that something was wrong. And then I started working with the sports psych and we, you know, kind of got back on track. Then I think, you know, get back to spring of 2019 or 2020 and COVID hits, all of those stressors pile on and that comes roaring back and then some. And so in May or June, my boyfriend actually brought up to me, he said, I Googled some of the things that you've been talking about lately, like being cold all the time, even though it was really hot out, being really irritable and having my moods change a lot and just a couple of little things that weren't characteristic to the Alice that he knew. He Googled those and the first thing that popped up was an eating disorder. And so we went on a hike and he told me this, that he had 
done this research and he thought that I might have an eating disorder. And I kind of laughed him off. I said, you know, I think I might have some disordered eating, but like, who doesn't? That was kind of how I justified it in my head that, you know, this is what society does. And like, yeah, I probably have some disordered eating, but that's just that moment that, okay, maybe this isn't totally right. But I also didn't believe that I would ever have an eating disorder. Like, I had no education on eating disorders. I'd been taught, I think one day in sixth grade health class that eating disorders and anorexia in particular, you know, that's something that white teenage girls do to themselves because they want to be skinny. And so I thought, that's, I love food. I, that's not something that, that I would do to myself. I didn't understand that it wasn't a choice, that it wasn't something I could control or not. So the easier decision essentially in that what if was denial or not even necessarily knowing how to admit that there's something happening. You now are on snow in the spring of 2020 mm -hmm. and it's clear that there's something different. Yeah, and fall of 2020. Fall of 2020, sorry. And it's clear that there's an issue. From that point to when you got back on snow, talk to us about that journey. On the last day of that camp in September, we'd had a team dinner. I had been really stressed about food that day in particular. And afterwards, my PT asked for me to go up to her room. She, she asked me how I was doing. For me to just lose it, I just started crying and I told her, I don't know what's wrong, but something is wrong. I'm so sad all the time and like I can't, I can't do anything the way that I want to. Thankfully, she was on it talked to U.S. ski team medical staff and got connected with the U.S. Olympic Committee medical staff. And so I ended up going weirdly down to Texas to get some tests done. A psychologist looked me in the eye and said, I've looked at, you know, all of the data we've compiled over the course of this visit and I would diagnose you with anorexia nervosa. It didn't make sense and I didn't have the education on, on everything that kind of came with it. I couldn't understand that that's what was causing all of my emotional problems. And unfortunately, I I tried to eat more and was like tracking all of my food, trying to prove that I was eating more. But instead by tracking my food, I was seeing the calories that I was consuming and that just scared the hell out of me. And the eating disorder was so deeply ingrained that even with that number of people helping me, trying to help me, I couldn't hold myself accountable. Nothing had changed. I still couldn't ski the way I wanted to. I literally on a minute and a half downhill course where I'm normally right on par with my teammates. I was three to five seconds out every single run. Uh, I was 20 pounds lighter than I normally would be. I was still an emotional wreck. And so halfway through camp, um, we got some blood work done and it was showing signs that my organs were starting to break down. That was when my coaches really pulled the plug. They said, we're not letting you come to Europe with us. You're, you're not in a state that you can compete. You, I really resisted because I still didn't think that it was bad enough that I couldn't compete for the winter. And yeah, I lived in a hotel and did 10 hours of eating disorder treatment a day, seven days a week for six weeks. That ended up being probably the most valuable six weeks in my life. Throughout treatment, at what point did you see some light at the end of the tunnel? Once I started learning the chemistry behind it allowed me to understand this was like, it was a neurological disorder. It wasn't just me choosing this. And I think that was kind of my main turning point in treatment to actually learn the science of mental health disorders in general, understanding that eating disorders don't just clear up overnight but that once you have a set of tools to address every aspect of the eating disorder and how it manifests in different ways, that you can tackle it and you can fight it every single day and you can overcome it bit by bit. Even two weeks later, when I felt good enough to leave treatment, there was a lot of that fear of like, how am I gonna hold myself to this? And honestly, I still get some of that fear today because I still really struggle with body image issues. I have days where I have a really poor relationship with food getting my life back on track emotionally and mentally and literally my main focus was joy and it sounds really simple and straightforward but it was a daily battle of 
not being overwhelmed by eating three meals and a snack or two and learning how to ask people for help during that period of time, learning to be patient when when things weren't going my way and when I felt like a failure and learning to accept that I don't have to win every battle, I don't have to be perfect. I can fail and I can be a vulnerable human being and that's okay. I learned that I am now a recovering perfectionist. I'm no longer the perfectionist, I'm recovering perfectionist. Um, and that's given me a lot of space to just accept myself and understand that I can be driven. I can still pursue my goals without having to be so insanely self-critical all the time.